Good afternoon um, and welcome to viewers of the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign weekly broadcast, which has morphed into a weekly interview with people we think have something very significant to contribute to the conversation on how to build effective solidarity with the beleaguered people of Palestine. We've had a lot of distinguished guests over the preceding weeks. I'm delighted this week um, to welcome Tony Greenstein, who's speaking to us from not South Africa, not Palestine, but far away, uh, Brighton. Um, Tony, welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you're a contributor to the book that people can see behind me, um, this volume here, Anti-Semitism Wars. But for a very long time, it seems to me, you've been blogging and writing and analysing um, the efforts by the pro-Israel lobby here in the UK to silence dissident voices. Uh, it's been going on and on and on and on. Um, Tony, why, why, when did it start in its present form and why do you think the timing is significant? Well, I, I think there's always been a war of narratives uh, from the very start, uh, because until, uh, until we see the end of the Zionist state uh, and Zionism, uh, you will always have that propaganda war. And uh, Israel, unlike South Africa, has massive overt backing from the West, not simply the Conservative Party in this country, but all political parties who've now come up with the uh, notion that if you don't support Zionism, the so-called Jewish people's right to self-determination, then you're anti-Semitic. So, that is a powerful weapon, and uh, I've always felt, being Jewish, that it was uh, beholden upon me in particular to speak out against the claim that Zionism uh, and being Jewish are one and the same. Good. What about the timing then? It's reaching, I mean, Corbyn's the leader of the Labour Party. He's besieged on all sides by rats like Tom Watson, Wes Streeting, um, people who are notoriously absent from serious anti-racism uh, activity, but now they're piling in and accusing Corbyn of racism. Can you explain that timing and why the focus on Corbyn? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> the timing is uh, clear. I mean, there's a great constitutional crisis today. There is a danger, as far as the ruling class and the establishment are concerned, that Corbyn might slip into power. That is a great, great worry. Uh, and it always has been a worry ever since he got elected, quite accidentally in many ways, uh, by, the, uh, by uh, the Labour Party membership. Back it was never supposed to happen, was it? Miliband wanted to preclude a victory for the left. Yeah. Well, yes, that was one of their key strategic mistakes. They thought, they, they believed their own propaganda that if you had one person won the vote, they would never vote for the left. Uh, and comfortable in that assessment, uh, 35 or 36 members of the PLP nominated Corbyn and therefore he, he got over just the uh, the low, the bar of 15%. Uh, and that was, a, as uh, Margaret Beckett said, uh, she described herself as a moron for having done that. And I agree with her assessment, but not for those reasons. So if, do you think a mind experiment um, and we hope that the right in the Labour Party will be defeated. Their efforts to open up the NHS to American corporations, their efforts to uh, have, you know, possibly another war, but certainly their efforts to silence pro-Palestine voices. Do you think if Corbyn were to fall, the, the din would end? Uh, yes, I think the major, the major impetus for it would have gone. Uh, I'm not saying it will end. Uh, I think there would be a continuing witch hunt of his supporters in the Labour Party. I don't think it will end tomorrow, even if Corbyn goes. But certainly uh, the major impetus behind it. Uh, and let's be clear, you mentioned Tom Watson, the, uh, the total nutter hypocrisy of the man. Uh, in 2010, I mean, if you remember New Labour and its war against asylum seekers, uh, and Tom Watson was in the middle of that, in the Hodge Hill by-election in Birmingham in 2004. He was part of a campaign to demonise asylum seekers, and his campaign was waged against the Liberal Democrats. They said, uh, they are on your side, we are on 
the Lib Dems are on your side of the asylum seekers. We are on your side. The Lib Dems want to give your money in benefit to asylum seekers. And that came culminated in 2010 uh, in a Labour MP, uh, Phil Woolis, uh, waging a quite despicable war campaign in his own constituency in Alderman Saddleworth, I think it was, uh, when he put out a leaflet, Stand By Phil, uh, with pictures of Muslims declaring that they would behead anyone who disagreed with them. Uh, and an internal memo surfaced which said uh, uh, their strategy was to make the white folks angry. And that the reason why it surfaced was because of a high court action brought by the losing Lib Dem, who alleged uh, the uh, Labour had lied uh, about him. And it was successful. Phil Lewis was debarred uh, and removed from Parliament. Uh, and Tom Watson uh, wrote in Labour Uncut, and it's still on the web and it's on my blog, uh, he wrote about how he'd lost sleep thinking about poor Phil. And this is the rat, uh, the man who <laughs> says that you must remove every last anti-Semite from the Labour Party. I mean, it, it, it's incredible. I mean, there isn't an anti-racist bone in his body. I mean, uh, the man is a complete fake and hypocrite, but he's been allowed to get away with it because our media doesn't broadcast anything which is contrary to that uh, narrative. Of course, people who are waiting for the media to transform will, will wait forever. So you've mentioned Willis, you've mentioned Watson, really very much tainted by, by, by naked racist themes uh, in order to get elected. Can we talk about the, love, the unlovely Margaret Hodge? Um, <laughs> she's also, she's leading the pack in many ways, or she's at the front of the pack. Um, but she herself um, had a relationship with the BNP, I believe, that you might want to comment on. Tony. That's right. I mean, it, she's the MP for Barking. And Barking used to be represented by a, a very good Tribune MP, a Jewish MP, Joe Richardson, uh, who was very much on the left. Uh, unfortunately, Margaret Hodge, the multimillionaireess who was mayor of Islington, uh, took her place. And uh, Margaret Hodge, in response to the BNP, who had gained, I think, 11 council seats, uh, in the mid-1990s uh, in Barking, uh, proposed a local housing policy which would favour locals over outsiders. And this was clearly a naked attempt to house white people only. And the BNP was so enthusiastic about it, and you can just Google this, that they sent her a bunch of flowers and, uh, to say thank you very much, Margaret, for giving such support to our policy. So the idea that this woman... Uh, is somehow an anti-racist. Again, it's for the birds. I mean, she has a pretty despicable record. Uh, she was instrumental. In general, in general, yeah. yeah she was instrumental. Well, by the way, for people who are not, for people for, who might be listening from abroad, Tony, they may not know what the BNP is. British oh, National, British National Party were a neo-Nazi party, very nakedly uh, swimming in Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, and so on. But maybe Tony, you know much, much more about it. Do you want to? Yeah. I want to develop that point because it's quite interesting about Hodge. She's very much a character to the fore in this. Let's, let's destroy her. Well, I mean, she, I say she was mayor of Islington. She went for the nomination, I believe, of Islington North MP and lost to Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, she used to be uh, a fake member of the left, but uh, no one really believed that. Uh, and she, uh, during a time as uh, Islington, the leader of Islington Council, she was active and complicit in covering up child abuse in council homes. And that's documented uh, and is in the newspapers and so on at that time. Unbelievably, Tony Blair still made her Minister for Children, but that, that just shows you their contempt uh, for those who are affected. So Hodge, who's leading the hue and cry and who's so morally incensed at Jeremy Corbyn's racism, she well, dabbled in racism herself publicly, such that even the BNP... Uh, you know, we're, we're grateful towards her. And she also, I believe, had to pay back money. She had to, sorry, to pay money, not pay back money. Most of the House of Commons had to do that previously. But she had to pay damages to some victims of child sexual abuse whom she had impugned and tried to silence. I understand. People won't believe that. Can you tell them where in your blog to find that and, and elsewhere? I think you just Google. I, I'm not sure if I put it on... Uh... I have actually, but I can't remember. But she paid about thirty thousand pounds in damages to one particular uh, victim that she had defamed. 
Uh, yeah. But you can easily Google that. Just Google Margaret Hodge and libel damages and it will come up all the details. Absolutely despicable. Tony, like you're Jewish. Uh, so is Jackie Walker. Moshe Markovair was expelled from the Labour Party for a period or so maybe just suspended. He, he managed to get back in again. You know, he was expelled, but uh, he was the one who got away. They had yeah. to. Uh, Jackie's also black. Uh, Mark Wadsworth is black. What's going on when in the Labour Party, the witch hunt is really prioritising people who are Jewish and black for expulsion? Can you explain that? Well, if you're Jewish uh, and you're anti-Zionist, then you're the wrong sort of Jew. And so you're doubly guilty in a sense. But it's natural. I mean, if you oppose apartheid in Israel, if you oppose Zionism, then you'll be an anti-racist. And therefore, anti-racist will want be one of the key targets of the so-called anti-Semitism witch hunt. So it's quite natural that people like Jackie Walker, Mark Wadd with Cyril Chilson is another, uh, and myself, uh, will be... Uh, suspended or expelled. As say, Moshe Machava, who's the founder of Matt's Pen, the Israeli socialist organization, uh, was himself expelled by Sam Matthews, but he, because there was such an outcry, because Machava is a renowned uh, academic, a former professor at King's College, they had to reinstate him. But uh, I mean, yes, the, the witch hunt is directed against anti-racists, because we oppose apartheid in Israel, who that is now called anti-Semitic or anti-Semitism. So there's a pretty firm logic to what some people think is simply bizarre. There's yeah. Jewish and black comrades who are being targeted. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. I mean, that's why uh, so many black people, so many Jewish people have been expelled under this witch hunt. Uh, whereas the right, the people who are, I mean, like John Mann, he brought out an antisocial behaviour uh, handbook, which listed under the kind of antisocial behaviour, gypsies or travellers. Uh, clearly nakedly racist. He was even interviewed about that by the local police force. But John Mann has now been uh, appointed by Number 10 Downing Street as their advisor on anti-Semitism. So you're having racists, open racists, who nonetheless are leading the anti-Semitism witch hunt, because you can't expect anything else from the Labour right, who waged a war against asylum seekers uh, and uh, accused them of stealing our benefits. You know, I mean, that, that was the... Uh, the message. So, I mean, for these people to present themselves as uh, anti-racist is the purest hypocrisy. But you won't hear that on the BBC. Look, these guys are being expelled and suspended. Uh, veteran campaigners against racism of every type. Corbyn is a veteran campaigner against racism. The Jewish Chronicle and its sister papers called him an anti-Semite. They first of all said... He's a bit soft on anti-Semitism, but then it became clear they thought he was an anti-Semite. He's also an existential threat, I believe, to the Jewish community in the UK. Tony, how absurd does this get? Well, desperate times, desperate measures, in a sense. Uh, it is a great fear, a great fear that Corbyn could slip into power somehow. I mean, that is what it is. I mean... If you can look at it from their point of view, and I think it's sometimes good to put yourself in their shoes, Corbyn was elected unexpectedly. Corbyn, with John MacDonald, had voted against uh, the Labour whip more times than anyone. He was identified. He was the chair of Stop the War uh, campaign. He'd been outspoken on Palestine. He didn't like NATO. Britain is the second major ally uh, of the United States in Europe. We have a special relationship. Uh, and here you have... The, the leader of the second major party in Britain, uh, who, who doesn't like the American alike, doesn't like wars and all the rest of it. I mean, that's a problem. That would have sent alarm bells ringing in Langley, Virginia. The CIA would have had a heart attack, many of their operatives. Of course, there were plans in foot in case something like this happened. Operation Gladio, was, you had stay-at-home teams throughout Europe. And they did intervene in places like Greece, Italy, France, where there were large communist parties. So this is immediately after the second. It's immediately after the Second World War. The dirty tricks are they left really, them behind for the years. Are well documented, yeah. yeah. I mean, Italy, they were responsible in the seventies for people who planted bombs, such as at Bologna uh, railway station. So the idea that uh, they wouldn't intervene in British politics is absolutely absurd. I mean, we know Israel's done because of the, the lobby by Al Jazeera. 
but I suspect that was the tip of the iceberg. We only saw a glimpse. We saw nothing about British intelligence or American intelligence. But the idea that they have no involvement, really, if you believe that, you really are naive. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Al Jazeera documentary, The Lobby. So we saw on that, here's a million quid made available for Labour Friends of Israel. And um, there's uh, Shai Massot, an Israeli spook, working at the embassy, working with the young Robin, uh, caught on camera, uh, saying he can bring down a, or he would like to bring down a government minister, um, Sir Alan Duncan, who was insufficiently pro-Israel. Uh, Theresa May said it was all done and dusted, closed after 24 hours. Massot was whisked out the country. Uh, Theresa May says it was finished. He got an apology from Regev. Um, why the unseemly haste, do you think? Well, I think there's probably a very close relationship between, between Israel's intelligence services abroad uh, and Britain. I mean, uh, Britain will know who are the main <coughs> intelligence operatives. Shah Massot was probably operating, not certainly not as a diplomat, but as a an emissary of the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So he was, in a sense, uh, operating by himself. And it's clear he was hauled in because uh, he was becoming a rogue operative, in a sense. So he, he'd shot his mouth off once too often and they pulled him back. But Britain understood uh, what it was about. I mean, obviously, if it was Russia who'd done that, then there would have been expulsions and banner headlines in the newspaper and all sorts of it. But... Israel is our ally, so it gets away. I mean, just as it got away with forging British passports for its raid in, was it Dubai? I think it was when Dubai, they. Dubai, the hotel room assassination. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It, you know, I mean, these. Uh, then there was a, one or two expulsions, but uh, there's a tacit understanding, isn't there, with Israel that wouldn't apply if it was uh, another state, especially one that we're not friendly with. Iran, if the, Iran did that, you'd never hear the end of it. Can I add a Scottish note to this for uh, people who are particularly interested in our little parish up here? Um, the Scottish government declared itself utterly opposed to BDS, vowed, quote, unquote, to oppose BDS, uh, but against all boycotts. But the minister responsible told, uh, made a public statement that she would not be attending and nobody would be attending any events in the Russian Year of Culture event <laughs> to be held in Scotland. So absolutely for boycott of, uh, of Russia, uh, whilst claiming not to be for... There boycott. are always boycotts which are kosher. I mean, don't forget, I mean, Israel, which so opposes boycotts, has enforced a boycott on Gaza. I mean, that, that's the reality. What's the siege is? It is a form of boycott uh, of a special kind. No, but surely boycotts built into the, the very essence of the Zionist project from the very beginning. From the very beginning, the Yeshuv, the Jewish Zionist community, boycotted everything Palestinian. Poor yes. people on tomatoes tried to smash its economy and so on and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so a boycott, boycott of Jewish labor was the, the, the main policy of history, the Zionist so called trade union. They collected the special Jew levy over and above your normal union Jews to finance the boycott campaign. So, yes, boycotting uh, Palestinians has always been second nature to Zionists. Be, be careful when you talk about Union Jews. It could be construed as anti-Semitic in some way. Um, we have to watch what we say. You're familiar with the ridiculous incident that happened at SOAS, Tony. Uh, Omar Barghouti and Ronnie Casals and other uh, icons of the movement were speaking and um, the BBC reported an anti-Semitic outrage. Could you comment on that? Yes, I think it was, uh, you're now putting me on the spot. Uh, it was Jonathan Hoffman and someone, I think, said, do you have, and that became Jew have or something like that. Uh, the BBC actually backed off. It was Raim Kassam, I think it was. That's uh, right. Our UKIP special okay. advisor who ran with this, and the BBC, of course, swallowed it, as they usually do, but when recordings made it clear that nothing of the sort had been said, then they were forced to backtrack. But Jonathan Hoffman, being a, a professional liar, of course, uh, would swear to it to this day. Well, it's, I think it's a tiny thing, but it's, it's indicative of the bent 
the, the, the inclination of the BBC. What you've said is absolutely true. I'd forgotten the guy's name. It was a Muslim name of the journal. But a hack reported, when somebody has said, do you really believe that, mm -hmm. uh, reported an anti-Semitic outrage. And the BBC website, I believe, carried it for about 18 hours yeah, uh, yeah. before they pulled it. Yeah, absolutely shocking. Tony, um, is, there a, is there a parallel here? Greg Philo wrote, of course, as you know, about uh, bad news from Israel, the media, and he reports that when he speaks to serious people in the media, managers and so on, he says, look, come on, you know this is rubbish. You're not giving the Palestinians a fair shake. He says that he sometimes, he quite often hears the same words, um, I've got a mortgage. The cynicism, the, the, they, they know that what they're putting out is, um, is absolutely phony. Mark Wadsworth mentioned to a meeting up in Edinburgh um, that he'd got word from Jeremy Corbyn's office that Jeremy believed that he was not being racist in any way or anti-Semitic in any way, but no public uh, declaration of support. We've heard the same sort of thing from Labour leaders in Scotland, but they won't make a public statement. To what extent do you believe this is fear or is it willing collaboration with, uh, with these disgraceful attacks on anti-racists? Well, I mean, the first thing it's meant to make it clear about Corbyn is if Corbyn had wanted to put this uh, fire out, what he did instead was actually help spread the flames. He poured petrol on it instead of water. If from the very start, and I, mean, I saw it immediately when I was suspended and others, that this whole, these whole allegations of anti-Semitism were not spontaneous. They came from somewhere. We didn't know where, but we had a good suspicion. If Corbyn, instead of simply saying, I am not anti-Semitic and repeating it ad nauseum, but said, I condemn anti-Semitism where it exists and it's negligible, but I also condemn those who use anti-Semitism as a means of silencing supporters of Palestine and, and, and anti-Zionism, uh, and Zionism, then I think he would have had a far easier uh, road ahead of him. He should have dealt with it in that way. He should have condemned the weaponization of anti-Semitism which is exactly what has happened. I mean, let's face it, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to work out if the Daily Mail, the paper that supported Hitler before the war, is so keen on fighting anti-Semitism, there must be something wrong with this campaign. The same paper that employs Katie Hopkins and the Sun, which employed Katie Hopkins, someone who called for a final solution after the Manchester bombing, but of Muslims. You know, if this kind of uh, paper, you know, uh, can throw its weight behind the false anti-Semitism campaign, then it doesn't take genius to work out what's happening. Unfortunately, Corbyn and his abysmal advisor, Seamus Milne, I mean, he bears more responsibility than anyone, did not call it out when it began. And the more he apologised, the more he was caught in the web. Because when you apologise to Zionists, they go for you. They take, say, thank you very much, put it in their back pocket, and then proceed accordingly. And that's what's happened. So today we have a situation where an affiliate of the Labour Party, the Jewish Labour Movement, is basically calling for a vote against the Labour Party if Corbyn still leads them. It's a nonsense situation. The JLM should be expelled, disaffiliated as of now, because it refuses to support the Labour Party. The Labour Party chooses its own leader, not them. And, and, to, and this week in the Jewish Chronicle, and if I can uh, just get maybe the headline and if I can find it for one minute. Uh, get back, Tony, get in front of the camera. Right, what have you got here? And, uh, can you read that? Yeah, clearly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Because the Labour MPs will ignore Jew hate to fight Boris. Oh, my God. Uh, in other words, you've got to prioritise the fake anti-Semitism uh, smears. It's necessary at the expense of a Labour general election victory. And they're complaining that some Labour MPs now want to drop it and get on with fighting an election. That is where this absurdity has ended up. And the JLM is basically refusing to support Labour. It did it at the Peterborough by-election. Presumably, they wanted Brexit, the Brexit party to win. You know, why? Because the, Israel, the needs of the Israeli state come before... Uh, anything to do with fighting poverty, etc. in this country. They're not socialist, of course, but... T Tony, tell viewers, tell us about the Jewish labour movement, what it is, who it's related to in Israel, and what it supports in Israel, and yet still remains a, 
a, a valuable affiliate of the Labour Party. This is this is not known to a lot of people. Well, I don't have a, lot, a, a massive amount of time, and I could spend the whole programme just on that. The Jewish Labour Movement, by its own admission, on its own website, says it's the sister party of the Israeli Labour Party. It's more than that. It's really the British operative wing of the Israeli Labour Party. It virtually collapsed as Pearl Zion in 2004 when it was renamed Jewish Labour Movement, which is a complete, its very name is a lie. There is no Jewish Labour Movement in this country, and it doesn't have Jewish workers in it. It represents basically the Israeli state inside the British Labour Party. Quite unique. No other state in the world has it. It doesn't represent Jewish members of the Labour Party. The majority of its members are not Jewish. Indeed, I suspect, I, I suspect that here, if you looked at Jews in the Labour Party, the majority would say they're not Zionists and not members of the JLM anyway. So it represents nothing but the Israeli state uh, uh, and the Israeli you Labour about, Party. You spend a bit of time on that, Tony, because the name gets bruited abroad constantly, the Jewish Labour Movement. They must be marching in demonstrations on May Day with banners and serried ranks of Jewish workers. You're yeah. saying it's an entire, yeah. what do you call it? A, when there was a Jewish labour movement in this yeah. country, when there was a Jewish labour movement, and a there was a time in the early 1900s when there were 30 Jewish trade unions, the Jewish cabinet makers, the Jewish furniture makers, the Jewish bakers union of Manchester, of Leeds, and so on. They were not Zionists, because if you're a worker, you were fighting in the here and now for your wages and conditions. You weren't fighting to, to self-repatriate. Yeah, it was the fascists who were calling for Jews to go, and the Zionists were saying, we agree. So, so most Jewish workers had nothing at all to do with Zionism. Uh, they may think the idea of Palestine is some, uh, uh, some distant memory, but most Jews didn't want to go to Palestine because of the two and a half million Jews who emigrated from Tsarist Russia because of the pogroms, barely 1% went to Palestine. So Palestine was not uppermost in their memory. And instead, there were no immigration barriers stopping you going in the Ottoman Empire, as it was then. So they could have gone, but there was no reason for them to go. They came to the United States, and some of them stopped off 100 or so thousand in Britain. So when, the, when there was a Jewish labor movement, which was a militant Jewish labor movement, that had nothing to do with Zionism. So it's complete fakery. It's borrowing your memory. These people are not workers in any sense, shape, or form. Yeah, the most the most reactionary and backward section of the British petty bourgeoisie, if you can say that. Uh, nothing more. And most of them are not even Jewish. You know, in Brighton, you have a whole group of JLM members. One or two are Jewish at best. I mean, uh, it, it's about Israel. And they were refounded in 2015 for one purpose only. It's Asa Wynne Stanley, who's written in, in an article in Electronic Intifada. They were mm. refounded to get rid of Corbyn. That was their main task. And that's what they've pursued ever since. So before 2015, it probably exists on paper only. Maybe they could all meet in one room. Uh, there's no labour, uh, there's no trade union element to it. And then something springs up in 2015, it, coincidentally the same time that Corbyn's elected, with a re and, and he has a, a long-term record of support for Palestinians. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's on record in some of the uncut material in the, the Al Jazeera uh, programme that Asa Wynn Stanley uh, saw, where uh, the leader of them, uh, Jeremy Newmark, who has a history of his own, he was accused of walking off with thousands of pounds from the Jewish Leadership Council, uh, and uh, he'd been the subject of a very adverse remarks in an employment tribunal decision in the uh, Fraser versus UCU back in, I think, 2011, uh, when he'd again tried to use the anti-Semitism card, but without success. I mean, it was led by this shyster, in a sense, uh, who, who pioneered their tactics. And it, it's interesting, incidentally, I, I mentioned this, when the Labour came up with its anti-Semitism code of conduct, do you remember last year? Yes. Over the IHRA, its chair, Ivor Kaplan, accepted it. And immediately in the Jewish Labour movement executive, there was a massive backlash against what he had done. Because Kaplan didn't seem to understand that whatever else has happened, you never reach an agreement with Corbyn or the administration. If you ask for something and they agree, you ask for more. You never ever, so whatever concessions Corbyn makes, 
they will never be enough until he hands in his resignation letter. Then and only then will they be happy. Right. Um, can you go, come back to the UCU, Tony? Um, it was a tremendous uh, embarrassment and defeat for the attempts to smear, in this case, the University College Union as institutionally anti-Semitic. Some of it was even comical, but it was very serious as well. But the pro-Israel group suffered a huge defeat. Now, I and other members of our campaign have been in court, uh, fa you know, charged with, uh, with racism, anti-Semitism. And every time you get even the level playing field, I don't mean it's level playing field for poor people that don't have any money, but when you're organized and you can go to court, at very least the Zionist claims can be cross-examined, can be challenged, can be demolished. And that's what happened with the UCU. Um, what's, th there's no possibility of doing that in the Labour Party. It's a court, it's a court, the star chamber. Um, how, how do you, how do you deny if, if I, God forbid, if somebody calls me a paedophile and then somebody else says, well, you know, he's been accused of being a paedophile. And then the, the, the paper says there's widespread accusations that he's a paedophile. And then it goes round and round. And now I have to say there's no basis there whatsoever. I'm using this as an example. Um, but how do you defend yourself against it? Because there is no substance to it. You can't prove that you never did. I mean, what, what's Jackie? What I can't remember, but. You know, what were you accused of initially? Were you accused of anti-Semitism? No, no, I wasn't. Uh, in, was it March 21st? I, I received a letter in the post. I joined the Labour Party, rejoined it after many years. I was suspended originally under the Kinnock witch hunt, but I rejoined. And then six less months, I, I received a, a letter in the post which simply said, you have been suspended because of remarks you were alleged to have made. No indication as to what those remarks were. Came out of the blue. I mean, I had my suspicions, of course, but nothing more. So you were charged with making remarks, but you were not told what the remarks were? No, and I wrote, uh, sent emails to John Stolliday, who was then head of the, the compliance unit. I received no reply or anything. It was only two weeks later when my son told me that on the internet there were articles in the Telegraph and the Times saying that I had been suspended as part of the anti-Semitism witch hunt. And they gave examples. Uh, one example was that uh, I had said that Israel's marriage laws are similar to those in Nazi Germany. And this was raised by my investigator, as a man a nondescript by the name of Harry Gregson, in my investigation. And I said, yeah, I said it. And I said, on page eight of Hannah Arendt's book, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt, the most famous Jewish political philosopher of the 20th century, herself a refugee from Nazi Germany, spoke about how in an Eichmann trial, when the prosecutor Gideon Hausner had denounced the Nuremberg laws, she said there was a certain irony in it because the, the Nuremberg trials uh, laws they, After uh, the Second World War, the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals, yeah? Uh, no, no, the, not the trials, sorry, the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, right. yeah, okay. which deprived, removed citizenship from Jews. They forbade sexual or other relationships between Jews and non-Jews. They forbade marriage between Jews and non-Jews. And the same situation is, occurs in Israel today, or at the time of Hannah, when Hannah Aron wrote that you, if you're Jewish, you cannot marry an un-Jew. And what is the difference? Yeah, in Israel, marriage is under the rabbis, it's under the religious authorities, and no rabbi would agree to marrying a non-Jew. Uh, so that was one of my crimes. Uh, there were many others. Uh, I said that Israel was waiting for Holocaust survivors to die, uh, so it could save on the welfare payments that it, it makes. And I said, I just produced a copy of Haaretz from Age, which said almost that because in Israel you have three days commemorating the Holocaust and then the rest of the, uh, the year uh, they do their best to ensure that Holocaust survivors remain in, immersed in poverty yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a reality the Holocaust is a very useful propaganda weapon for Israel when it comes to the actual survivors of the Holocaust basically the Israeli state could not care less yeah yeah uh, I mean there were I mean there were others I mean I was accused 
one of the things I was accused of was abuse of uh, Louise Ellman, who's a Labour MP for Liverpool Riverside. She appeared on the BBC Panorama programme. This despicable woman, twice in, at least in debates in Parliament over Israel's maltreatment of Palestinian children. You know, if you're a Palestinian child in the territories, over the age of 12, though some have been detained when they're earlier, but over the age of 12, armed soldiers can come to your house in the, at midnight or in the early hours of morning, drag you out of bed, blindfold you, beat you, transport you in a jeep to some unknown prison or a detention centre. You have no access to your parents, no access to a lawyer. You can have all the uh, pressure brought upon that child, including beating, sexual harassment, and even worse uh, forms of torture. Yeah. Uh, and Louise Ellman stood up in Parliament and defended this repeatedly on the grounds that these children are throwing stones, you know. As if they were, that would not be a, a crime. Uh, uh, it would be resistant to an occupation. But she bought entirely into Israel's military narrative. Because I said she was a supporter of the child abuse by Israeli soldiers, that was held to have shamed her. Uh, and I said to them at the time, uh, the woman has no shame. How can that be the case? <laughs> and, uh, nonetheless, that was uh, one of the things uh, I was convicted of. And I, I also uh, made heavy criticism of fake leftists like Owen Jones, uh, etc. I regret uh, nothing. But uh, 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 at the back of it, uh, I was expelled from being an anti-Semite. These are all pretexts. Yeah. So did did the did the how did the the, the ridiculous allegation of anti-Semitism blend in with the criminal or the the banning of a polemic, the banning of a firm, vigorous well, disagreement did. with a right-wing pro-war, pro-torture? They went out of the way, the barrister who conducted it, to say I wasn't being accused of anti-Semitism. The only thing I was said, alleged to have done was used a term which they said was anti-Semitic which was the use of the word Zio. And I said, Zio is short for a Zionist. If you think all Zionists are Jews, and it's not me, but it's you who's being anti-Semitic, yeah. because most Zionists are not Jews. Donald Trump, Steve Bannon, the neo-Nazi founder of the alt-right Richard Spencer, who declares he's a white Zionist. All sorts of rats and racists call themselves well, it's Zionists. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. One is allowed to, to demonstrate anger, disagreement, contempt for a political a body of political ideas. Right-wingers can call people like us commies. Um, yeah. uh, up here in Scotland, uh, people who are not in favour of independence often call those who are the Nats. Now, nobody goes to the police when you're called a Nat. It's certainly a gesture that I'm not... In, yeah. It indicates I'm not in sympathy with your position. But exactly. it's kind of preposterous, isn't it? I mean, it's a right-wing... It's a horrible right-wing term in America, snowflakes. You know, people who can't take... I, I hate it and, and I don't use it. But you know something? It, it's got a certain content. You know, some but people yeah, no, no, sure. want to hurl abuse at you, but they can't take the slightest criticism. Yes, of course, of course, of course. So that's what you got done for, criticising... That's my crimes. But, you know, they, they. it doesn't matter what you've done. They were going to get you. I mean, they were determined under uh, Maggie Cousins, uh, the chief witch finder general. They were going to find me. I mean, another of them was uh, Gordon Fairbrother, was it, of the community union, a very right-wing small union. And the guy who's repeatedly posted grossly sexist uh, and misogynist comments. I mean, he was also one of uh, the, the, the only momentum person on it, Amina Ibrahim, uh, one of Landsman's fr uh, friends. So, I mean, uh, she provided the left cover for it, uh, as she did with Mark Wads, uh, with her, uh, other people who are expelled, like Cyril Chilson. Tony, you've written fantastic stuff. I'm constantly in awe of your erudition. Um, I've done some reading and uh, uh, like to talk about the inherent um, anti-Semitism of the Zionist project. <laughs> I mean, German rabbis got it right away, and so did lots of other people. But in a nutshell, um, What's the relationship between, why is there a constant attraction between many, not all, but many of the Zionist leaders and some of the worst anti-Semites? I know you're writing a book about Zionism during the Holocaust. Can you, can you explain your basic argument? Well, 
it, it, it's a very simple one. I mean, uh, let me quote uh, A.B. Yehoshua. If you, uh, I'm going to... He's a major figure, isn't he? In... Uh, yes. Uh... Tell viewers who he is, first of all, Tony. Okay, yeah, A.B. Yehoshua is... Uh, he is a left Zionist novelist. He's a famous uh, uh, novelist in Israel. Uh, uh, and he... He gave a lecture, it was on the 22nd of January, 1982. It's on my blog, and uh, you can Google it. Uh, and he said, and it was a lecture to the Union of Jewish Students, and he said, anti-Zionism is not the product of the non-Jews. On the contrary, the Gentiles have always, the Gentiles and non-Jews have always encouraged Zionism, hoping it would help rid them of the Jews in their midst. Even today, in a perverse way, a real anti-Semite must be a Zionist. Uh, and that is really what it's about. Uh, yeah, If you're a, an anti-Semite, you don't want Jews living where you are. So you want to send them somewhere. And that's why Eichmann said he was a Zionist. That's why all the notorious anti-Semites have declared themselves Zionists. Uh, and that happens today. Donald Trump. You know, I mean, he, he welcomed a group of American Jews to the White House for Hanukkah and said that Israel is your country, as if somehow they're not part, they're not real Americans. So I mean, this is throughout. That is the basis. Zionism was a reaction to anti-Semitism, but it was a reaction of a different kind, because it accepted the terms of reference of the anti-Semites. Zionism accepted that Jews did not belong in the societies where they lived. They accepted that Jews were in exile, that their true home was Palestine. Therefore, there was a symmetry uh, of interests, if you like. And that is what has led to collaboration throughout the ages. And you will often get, and I mean, uh, uh, when you listen to Zionists uh, speak, uh, you could mistake it uh, for uh, anti Semites. I mean, uh, for example, Pinchas Ros Rosenblatt. Uh, the first Israeli Minister of Justice uh, in 1948, he's or 49, he said, uh, Palestine is an institute for the fumigation of Jewish vermin. Now, I mean, who, who normally would talk, use the term Jewish vermin? But anti Semites, of course. I mean, Hitler compared Jews to a basilisk. I mean, it, uh, and, and Rosenblatt wasn't an exception. He, 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 there's a whole history of Zionists making comments about Jews in the diaspora having brought all their misfortunes upon themselves. They deserved it. And if they don't get out of the, the Galut, the diaspora, then they cannot complain. Uh, and that was the basis of the Zionist attitude, of course, to the rise of Hitler himself. I mean, really filthy ideas. Filthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so wanting to get Jews out of Europe to fall upon the Palestinians and dispossess them. Tony, we've only got a few minutes left, um, sure. but I'm interested in your um, response to the news that uh, Gail Gado, Superwoman, um, has been in the news uh, suggesting that Israel should be a state of all its citizens. <laughs> and Netanyahu has reminded her, very, I think he said something like, uh, Gail, uh, a small detail, uh, the new the nation state law means that Israel is not a state of its own citizens. Can you comment on that, Tony? Are you, you, did you see that in the news in the last day or two? Uh, I haven't seen it in the news in the last day or two. I know that during the last the Israeli election campaign early in the year, Rotem Salah, I think her name was, an Israeli actress, said, what the hell is going on? Arabs are human beings after all. They're, they are part of the Israeli state. Uh, they're as much citizens as Jews. And Netanyahu, quite rightly, stepped in and said, no, 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 that's not true. Israel is a state of its Jewish citizens, not all of its citizens. Uh, and Forgive my ignorance, I've just come late to this game. When did this happen? Well, when was the Israeli election? Around April, wasn't it? Of this, right. uh, I think it was. And that was when it uh, occurred. And again, you can just Google this. Uh, for the details. But then the, the woman you mentioned who played Superwoman, uh, she backed up uh, Rotten Seller uh, mm -hmm. and said, yes, she's correct. But uh, she wasn't correct because Israel isn't a state of its own citizens, of all its citizens. 
it is a state apart from its citizens because there's no Israeli nationality. Uh, you know, in most countries, most states have a, a single nationality to which everyone who resides there belongs. But when you have the idea, which has been raised by Victor Orban recently, that Hungary is a Christian country. Well, obviously, if that's the case, then Jews don't belong or Muslims don't belong. So this is a, a thoroughly racist idea. And Israel, uh, by set, proclaiming itself Jewish, therefore proclaims that other people are second or worse citizens. They, they don't really belong in the national collective. Uh, Obviously, Rotom Salah disagreed with that uh, and believed that, you know, you should treat Arabs equally. And uh, she was reminded of what kind of state uh, Israel was. Nothing more. Mm. Tony, what do you think about um, a point that uh, Lenny Brenner made a long time ago? I was talking to him. that Most, most people who support the Palestinian people start off from... Um, the, the Zionist idea of a land without people for a people without a land. And the problem is there were a lot of people there and they lived in the land and the bride was beautiful and so on and so on. But Lenny's point was that even if Palestine was empty, there was something dark and, and horrible about Zionist incorporation of middle European blood and soil nationalism. And wherever it took root, it was going to be ugly. Do you want to comment on well, Zionism was no different from most European settler colonial movements. I mean, yeah. when British settlers went to Australia, they went with the idea of terra nullis, the land was empty. Because for settlers, they cannot see uh, the indigenous people. That was true in South Africa. So you had a similar myth to the one that was spread in Palestine. Namely, it was only when the, South, the white settlers went to South Africa that the black people came down because of the opportunities created for them. Yeah. Likewise, I mean, uh, Joanne Peters, in a famous or infamous book from Time Immemorial, which Norman Finkelstein savaged years ago, uh, put forward the same thesis that, no, there were no Palestinians. So they came because of Zionist immigration. Of course, other people who are more honest than him, uh, one of whom is called Echad Ha'am, Asher Ginsburg, who was the founder of cultural Zionism, he warned uh, in his own, sorry, I've got to just have a look. Uh, you won't see what I'm doing. Uh, in a book, uh, an essay called The Truth from Israel, he said, quote, we tend to believe abroad that Palestine is nowadays almost completely deserted, a non-cultivated wilderness. But in reality, this is not the case. It is difficult to find anywhere in the country Arab land which lies fallow. I say he said that in 1881. Uh, there are numerous reports of travellers uh, as to Palestine being anything but lying fallow. So, so it's yet another myth. I mean, the Zionists, I mean, certainly di did work. They certainly developed farms. Incidentally, uh, some of their early settlements, uh, when work needed to be done, it wasn't the Zionist settlers from Europe who did it. They brought in Jews from Yemen. Uh, and I, I re recently reading that there was a horrific death rate amongst them, over 50%. Uh, this is uh, Etan Bloom. If anyone comes across Etan Bloom, he wrote uh, a thesis, a PhD thesis, on Arthur Rupin, who I would say was the most important Zionist in Palestine pre-1948, bar Ben-Gurion himself. He was head of the Palestine office from 1908 onwards. He was a racial nationalist. Uh, I really have time. He's called today the father of land settlement in Palestine. He was that important. He was a man who believed in eugenics, the racial sciences, and so on. And in 1933, he went to Jena University in uh, Germany uh, to have a talk with uh, Professor Hans Gunther, who'd been imposed by the Nazis in that state as chair of racial, the racial sciences at that university. And they got on famously. They both agreed uh, with each other. Uh, and it's in his diaries. The diaries have been edited uh, in uh, some countries to eliminate this particular meeting. But uh, Rupin, after Rupin got on famously, Rupin incidentally laid the basis in his negotiations for Havara, the transfer agreement between Nazi Germany and the Zionist movement, which basically broke the boycott of Nazi Germany, because the Zionists are consistent, they don't like boycotts, whether it was of Nazi Germany or themselves today, 
So in that sense, uh, we, we can't fault people. So the people who are involved in this coalition, pro-Israel group, Tories, right-wing Labour, um, who are, and, and the media, um, not just the right wing, but the liberal media as well, the Guardian, who are attacking Corbyn and co and us as anti-Semites, uh, they contain within their ranks the Jewish Labour movement, the pro-Israel group, and <laughs> we mentioned Rupin, whose name is given to Rupin Boulevard that runs around the right. Knesset. That's right. Yeah. He says he says that the ancient Aryan Jews were corrupted by an infusion of Semitic genes. That uh, only yes, yes, they had a w wacky theory that the Arab Jews had corrupted uh, the pure Aryan Jews. I mean, you know, so said he was a, believer, a devout believer in the racial sciences. Rupert yeah. was once accused of being an anti-Semite by fellow Zionists and said, well, yes, so what? Uh, yeah. What's wrong with that? I mean, he was an anti-Semite by his own admission. Tony, uh, the, work, the work you're doing in excavating all this and bringing it in front of an audience, I think, is tremendous. And I do urge everybody here to sign up to Tony's blog. We'll put it um, in the comments at the end. Um, but Tony Greenstein, thanks very much. Um, thanks we've run out of time. Too. I would love to discuss much more. I think you're a font of real knowledge and encyclopedic knowledge on the subject. Um, and help and. I look forward to your book that will help to educate people to stand up to Zionism four square and treat it with the contempt that it deserves. As well, a, thank you very much, Mick, yeah. for uh, staging this interview. Yeah. Tony Greenstein, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, we'll, hope to, um, um, we'll hope to cooperate together to fight off this attack by the right. But um, Tony Greenstein thank, from Brighton, thanks very much again for agreeing to do this interview. Thanks, Tony. Okay, thank you, Mick. Cheers, then. Guys, I've got two points to make. One, Tony has contributed to this book, The Anti-Semitism Wars, by, uh, by uh, Carol Sabach. There'll be details posted at the end on where you can buy it. Tony's contribution deals with precisely um, the, the, uh, the attacks inside the Labour Party, um, not, to be, um, not to be missed. Um, I just got my copy today from Verso of a book called Stone Men, by Andrew Ross. Andrew used to work on building sites in Glasgow, but he moved on from that to become a professor at New York University. His book, Stone Men, is about Palestinian construction workers, building workers, skilled workers who dress stone and create many of the buildings that have been erected across the whole of Palestine and the Middle East. And he's dealing with the crimes of Zionism, the Zionist colonial project of dispossession from the point of view of those workers who must make a living, who have to build houses to feed families. Um, and they say they build houses for Israelis while Israel demolishes their own homes. It's a brilliant and unique uh, aspect, view of what's happening in Israel, Palestine, that I think you would want to follow up full details um following this um this interview so over the next three sundays we're really pleased with the bill affair that we have to offer and uh, next sunday we have an interview with mazin kumsia um mazin is the author of many works on palestine but including a history of palestinian popular struggle and I'll be interviewing Mazin next Sunday. Join us then, four o'clock. Following Sunday, it's Mahmoud Zouare. And Mahmoud is uh, one of the leaders in the Palestinian Popular Struggle Committees who actually confront the Israeli machine of dispossession, colonization in the West Bank. And I'll be looking forward to interviewing about the struggle on the ground there and what they face and how they mobilize what resources they have to confront this brutal uh, occupying power. Now, on the 18th of August, uh, we have uh, Nurit Peled Elhanan, an Israeli academic, who ha an activist, who has looked in great detail at uh, Israeli school textbooks and has written a seminal work called Palestinians in Israeli Textbooks, uh, which looks at the extreme racism and dehumanization 
that Israeli kids are taught. Nurit asks the question, um, how is it that Israeli soldiers can treat Palestinians in their power with such cruelty, arrogance and racism? And she thinks the answer lies in the school books that they are exposed to from a very young age. So next Sunday, Mazen Kumsiya. Following Sunday, Mahmoud Zware, two very important Palestinians who have ideas to offer uh, the, the conversation on effective solidarity, and an Israeli academic who also qualifies in that respect, Nurit Peled Elhanan. A real feast of uh, individuals who can help us to understand better what's going on in Israel Palestine. Hope to see you in. Sundays to come, 4 p.m. Thank you.